Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet. And today, we are here to talk about a topic that we've touched on in various ways over the seasons but haven't yet done a true deep dive on, um, and that is specifically money as it pertains to couples, relationships, and in the case of my guest, couples therapy. You guys write in all the time about the various issues that you're experiencing in your primary partner relationship. There's also, of course, tons of money issues in family and friends relationships, although I think just our spouse or significant other is worth its own deep dive. And what's interesting about the stories that we hear and the things that we experience in our own lives and relationships is that money is often just a shorthand for a lot of other things that we may be experiencing, differences in background, differences in values, and all of these various aspects of a relationship that may not be as easy to talk about because they're not as concrete as money is. On the other hand, many people find money to be the most difficult thing to talk about with a partner, and their problems and disagreements and disappointments with money get channeled into all kinds of other issues that are, for some people, less taboo. Suffice to say, very few people have a totally healthy, totally holistic, totally communicative, and totally unburdened relationship with money themselves, let alone when they come into long-term financial cohabitation with another person. Even questions as simple as, should we keep our money more? together or separate? Should we split bills evenly or based on how much we earn proportionally? Should we have a prenup? Things that seem fairly cut and dry and fairly based on finances are ultimately extremely emotionally charged questions, and the answers are more complicated than just whatever math makes sense on paper. My guest today is Dr. Orna Goralnik. She is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst based here in New York City. She is also the therapist featured on the Showtime series Couples Therapy, which is premiering its third season on May 13th. That is on Showtime. She sees couples in her practice all the time. She also sees them on the show and has a lot of really interesting and insightful things to say on the intersection of relationships and money. So without further ado, let's meet her. And thanks to Calm, the number one mental wellness app, and one of my personal favorite apps, that's actually true, for supporting the financial confessions. Calm is offering you an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash TFC. And also thank you to Athletic Greens for supporting this episode of the financial confessions. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash TFC and take ownership over your health and pick the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So welcome, Dr. Ralnick. Thank you for being here with us. Hi, Kelsey. Hi. Um, So can you tell a little bit more uh, to our audience about what you do, kind of what you specialize in? Sure. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and a psychoanalyst, um, which means I see people in an analytic practice. I see people often multiple times a week, sometimes using the couch. Um, And in addition, I also see couples. And um, I'm the therapist on the documentary series, Couples Therapy. And what is that? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's a very interesting project. We're now uh, in the midst of shooting our uh, fourth season. Um, It's a project in which we um, film uh, something like 20 sessions of my work with couples, uh, film it documentary style, meaning they're the couples, I mean, obviously they agree to be filmed, but there's no cameras in the room. It's all arranged so that the office feels like a regular therapist office. And um, we follow just a pretty straightforward couples therapy for a period of about 18 to 20 weeks. And um, the editors then, the directors and editors then do their magic and kind of somehow manage to condense an entire treatment into nine episodes. And, the series ends up following somewhere between three and four couples per season and the work they're doing in therapy. It's very close to close to how it really feels series, meaning it's not, there's no editing towards kind of any particular sensation. There's no guidance that people are getting in terms of 
what are the outcomes expected is really documenting a real treatment. And are these couples that you were working with prior and that you ask them to be part of the show? No, that, that, that would not really be an ethical thing to do in a private practice. No, these are people that the production team work diligently on recruiting. They interview thousands of couples and they recruit couples that want to work with me, want to be, or agree to be on the show. I mean, they, they don't always necessarily get aired, but um, they know they're being filmed and they're recruited. And then I just meet them on camera. Now you mentioned that it might be unethical um, and it's not my wheelhouse. I have many and the ethics of, uh, psycho- of psychology are not one of them, but you mentioned that it might not be ethical to ask uh, pre-existing patients to participate in something like this. But obviously in the history of kind of televised therapy, there's been um, some really bad stuff, uh, some really uh, what seems like even from a layman's perspective, not super ethical, not super optimal. In your view, what makes what makes worth what makes therapy worth doing on television in certain contexts and what sort of makes it good or bad examples um to be honest with you i haven't watched any other shows that that do this so i don't know what other people do um i can tell you from my own perspective what's ethical what's not ethical and what what's worth doing or not um First of all, in terms of why people want to do it, I mean, couple the couples, I don't know about the couples that are that apply f- to be on the series, but the couples that eventually are selected are couples that, first of all, really do want and need treatment. So that, that's the, the main thing that they're doing. Um, Many people in a certain way don't exactly mind being on camera or they're not exactly sure what it's going to feel like. So they give it a try. And some people give it a try and realize, you know what, I can't do this. And some people give it a try and realize it actually doesn't make a big difference. Um, And I think, you know, especially among younger people, I mean, I'm I'm watching my kids and, and people of a different generation. I mean, they live a lot of their life on social media anyhow. So it's not that odd for them to be doing it on camera. But from my own experience, I have to say that the surprising thing that occurred to me when I started doing this is that the work is the work and it doesn't matter if it's on camera or not. I mean, there are certain ways in which it does matter, but in terms of how the actuality of the work feels, it feels like the same kind of work. Um, I also think there are other reasons why people um, either choose to do it on camera or end up realizing that it was good for them to do it on camera, which is that it's in a certain way a chance for people to tell their story to a certain audience they have in mind that matters to them. So some people might be in some way both talking to me, but they're also talking to significant other people in their life that they want to tell their story to whether it's family members or a certain community or certain people that they have in mind that they're really talking to through me and through the cameras, Um, which is true in general in terms of treatment, that people are often talking to their therapist, but they're talking to more than their therapist in their mind. They they could be talking to their mom. They could be talking to a certain kind of someone who never understood them or who never got to hear their story, or they might be negotiating with an internal what we call an internal object. The reason why I wouldn't ask existing patients of mine to participate in this is because there's a certain kind of built-in power dynamic between therapist and patient. And I don't think people would be feel the complete freedom to consent or disagree. I think they would feel on some kind of basic level mildly coerced into Hmm. agreeing with my request. So I I don't think they would have the complete freedom to figure that out for themselves. So I I wouldn't do that. Um, Yeah. Well, so on our show, we typically talk about money and how it intersects with all things in this case being, um, you know, couples, uh, relationship problems, couples therapy, et cetera. Um, 
we talk a lot um, about the data around the role that money and finances plays in um, either problems couples experience or eventual separations, divorce, breakups, et cetera. From your sort of clinical experience, to what extent is uh, money or money and finances uh, a, a, a player in the, the couples that come into your office's problems? Um, that's a complex question. You know, there's a, there's a common belief among people that um, money and sex are like the main issues that couples come in with. And to a certain degree, on the face of it, it looks true that mm-hmm. often people come in either because they're not having sex or they're, they're having some issues around sex or they're having some tension or strife or stress around money. Um, so I would say that in my mind, it gets divided into two different categories when we think specifically about finances. One is couples that have real issues around finances, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but don't know how to talk about it. So they, their stressors or their issues appear in other domains, but really those other domains are proxies for tensions around finances. And then there are the couples that argue a lot about money and about finances, and often that is a proxy for other issues that they're really not dealing with. And and Mm -hmm. then money becomes kind of the easier arena or the more concretized arena to work through their issues or to act out their issues. Um, But, you know, finances and money are often tied to a very wide web of meaning for people. And um, I mean, I can map out just a few different things just to give you the beginning of a sense of how you can think analytically about the location of finances within, let's say, the matrix of a couple's life. But um, finances, first of all, have to do, first of all, there's the concrete reality of having and not having, having the, the ability to kind of live a livable life, you know, pay rent, buy food, have kids, the, the things that people often want and money is one of the ways that makes it possible or not. So there's like the material reality of money and the stress that comes with not having it. Hmm. Then um, there's all that money means to people. Money gets often very associated with uh, self-esteem. For some people, money is a way to mark whether they've made it or haven't made it in their life, whether they're a worthwhile individual or not. People uh, differ in terms of like their, the way um, finances and gender intersect. So women and men often have different feelings around money and different feelings about different distributions of money between them and at what it means. If one is earning more than the other, what does it mean between the couple? And that often intersects with gender. Um, money has to do a lot. It ties a lot for people with dependence. So um, if one person is more of the earner, has a, is the only or stronger earner, what does it mean for the other person? What does it mean for both of them in terms of dependence on each other? What kind of feelings and dynamics get stirred up around dependence? Um, money, of course, means power between people and how do they each relate to power? Does one feel... Um, more entitled to things because they earn more money? Does one feel like they've sacrificed much because they're not earning money or they've changed careers to support the family? Um, So a lot about power and sacrifice. Um, Money is deeply tied, of course, to issues of class and and, um, depending on people's class background, they will relate to money very differently. They will relate to spending differently. They will relate to what it means to have or not have. They will relate to the differences between them differently depending on their class background and their uh, loyalty to their class background. Loyalty to kind of one's class background is a very, very powerful dynamic between couples. And if people come from different class backgrounds as people often do, 
a lot of their issues around that get expressed through the way they talk about money. Um, I think those are good general ideas of like how I, beginning of how I map finances. Are there common habits or communication styles or sort of, um, you know, behaviors that you see in couples as it pertains to money uh, that you think are very kind of common mistakes that people make about it? The most common mistake that people make in my mind is not finding a way to be honest honest about what matters to people in terms of money. Uh, There's a lot of kind of beating around the bush and and talking about other things rather than talking directly about concerns about everything we talked about in terms of money. So that's the most common mistake. And then um, the other thing is, which is, it's related to the difficulty being honest is the tendency to get heated and um, there's a lot of uh, feelings of potential issues of humiliation and fear that get triggered around money and people have a hard time in those domains and they get heated they get either they shut down or they get furious or they do all sorts of maneuvers around communication that actually make the conversation impossible because either, again, people get too heated or shut down. So they make the conversation very difficult. Um, But it's related to the issue of being able to be honest. I think when people are very honest about money and what their concerns are, usually they can have very creative and productive and interesting conversations about what money means to each of them and then how to problem solve around it. But it's hard for couples to get to that point. When you talk about money being an easy kind of shorthand or a more comfortable sort of conduit for larger issues or larger sort of behaviors or miscommunications, can you talk a little bit about what that kind of translates to as you see it? So for example, we speak... um, we hear a lot from our audience about having financial problems and relationships that ultimately boil down to one person being a bit of a spender, the other being more of a saver, having very different relationships to um, what's appropriate on either of those sort of ends. What are the kinds of larger issues or, you know, sort of drivers that you're seeing that get sort of channeled through those relationships to money? What a great question. Love that question. Um, First of all, yes, people have a lot of arguments about, um, for example, spending. What's a good thing to spend on? What's a frivolous thing to spend on? What's worthwhile to spend on? What's not? Um, And um, in a way, it's you could think of it as similar to like, you know, should the knives in the dishwasher be up or down? You know, people have very strong opinions about that and they can argue till the cows come home about things like that so that some of it is just what do you do with difference someone likes to spend on this someone likes to spend on that and 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 people negotiate just their tension around difference through anything so that could be about money too but there are sometimes like much deeper issues that get communicated and negotiated through these um questions of, about, for example, spending that have to do, for example, as I mentioned earlier, let's say class background. So um, I had a couple actually on the on, on one of our seasons, and I, I feel like I can talk about them because they've, they, they don't, um, they haven't asked for confidentiality. So for them, they had, uh, they brought in a classic argument they had about um, a slushy, buying a slushy. And for her, who came from um, real kind of very basic working class family, buying a slushy meant I get to live like any other normal people in America and I can buy a slushy. It's not going to kill us to spend $3 on a slushy. For him, who came from a much more traditional 
middle class family with a lot of security and a lot of investment in the future. For him, it was like, why do you need a slushy right now? We can wait when I finish my degree and I start working properly. He was still in school. We'll have plenty of money for slushies and more. You don't need the slushy right now. So it meant a lot to them in terms of like their the class background they came from. And it took them a lot of time to kind of unwind and unspool what it meant for them to be spending the three bucks on the slushy. But really it, what it meant for them is like, which class background do I come from and wh who am I loyal to in terms of how I understand what I'm spending money on? Mm. That is interesting. I say get the slushy personally. So in all this talk about doing what's right for ourselves and caring for ourselves, it is time for a quick break. And this is technically an ad break, but our partners at Calm want you to focus on yourself for a moment. Take a deep breath and let it out. Relax wherever you're holding your tension. It's important to tune in and recenter, and Calm can help. With that said, we're excited to be partnering with Calm, the number one mental wellness app, to give you the tools to improve the way you feel. Reduce stress and anxiety through guided meditations, improve focus with curated music tracks, and rest and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories for children and adults. There's even new daily movement sessions designed to relax your body and uplift your mood. Some of you may know this, but it's true. I'm an ASMR queen, and as much as I love watching my ASMR videos on YouTube, uh, I also discovered the Calm app uh, because I'm also a trouble with sleeping queen. Um, and some of those sleep stories, man, they do it. And speaking of which, it was recently brought to my attention. I actually didn't see this myself. Um, Jonathan Bailey, our king icon of season two of Bridgerton, uh, that's Lord Anthony to you, uh, has his own sleep story. Uh, run, don't walk, I think is the phrase we're going to use here. Um, anyway, Calm is truly amazing. I really do think that. And Calm is offering you an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash TFC. Go to calm.com slash TFC for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash TFC. And as some of you may know, when speaking of taking care of myself, I recently experimented with cutting sugar out of my diet. Not completely, I'm not crazy. And also, I mean, listen, we need balance in this life, but I was really eating way too much sugar before. Uh, and while I wouldn't recommend this to everyone because your food and supplement choices are yours to make, I do often prioritize making healthy day-to-day -day choices for myself. And while I always do say yes to dessert and whatever else I want when I want, I also aim to find the right balance between things that are more indulgent and things that are more traditionally healthy. And there's a reason so many people like Athletic Greens and why you've probably heard so much about this product. Just one scoop of it includes 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source super superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. Athletic Greens is offering you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase when you go to athleticgreens.com TFC. Athletic Greens contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything, and it still tastes good. It costs less than $3 a day. Instead of grabbing a second or third cup of coffee in the afternoon, grab a green drink. And for every purchase, they donate to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the U.S. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com TFC. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash TFC to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Um, okay, so we have quite a lot of questions from our audience, so we'll try and get through as many of these as we can while we have you. Uh, so the first one, I know this is probably one that you're not going to be able to give like a hard yes or no to, but I would like to hear your thoughts. Is it generally better for couples to keep their finances separated? Great question. And of course, I do not have a one answer fits all. I do not. Um, I think the conversation about whether to do that can be a really interesting conversation. Why, why do couples need, like what is the pros and cons of keeping things separate versus together? What is the fear that each person has about keeping accounts separate versus about merging accounts? That, that conversation is fantastic. It's a really good conversation to have and it's not one conversation. And I can tell you that in the developmental trajectory of a relationship, that question should get revisited 
every new chapter. I mean, when people start off in a relationship, they might feel one way about merging finances. Later in life, they might feel differently. And later in life, again, they might feel differently and they might wanna do trial and error. And some people do a combination of some accounts separate and some kind of kitty that they share in. But the, the, the logic and the fears around each option are really interesting for people to talk about. And it's not one conversation. Um, we have someone asking, how do I know if I need individual versus couple therapy? Um, again, I can't answer that like with a one answer fits all, but um, let's just say if a person realizes that they repeat a certain pattern in most of their relationships, probably they need to do some work on their own before they do couples work. I, I mean, when I'm working with couples and the couples are both doing individual work and couples work, the work goes a lot faster. So if you have the time and finances to do both, sometimes it's better to do both. Um, trying to think if there's anything I could really offer that would answer that question and, and kind of one size fits all. Well, I think that's already a very useful litmus test because if you are having a lot of very specific problems in your marriage or your primary romantic relationship that you don't see in other areas of your life, that's probably an indication that it's a dynamic between the two of you. But if you know, you're getting in the same fights with a lot of people, um, the problem might be you. Um, okay, uh, so someone is asking, um, I'm very interested in the impact that parents have on their children's relationship with money. What are some ways that we can break the cycle um, of the money habits that they inherited? First of all, whoever's asking the question, yes, it's really interesting, first of all, how children kind of, what they take from their parents, how much they absorb from their parents in terms of their parents' relationship to money. And again, I wanna emphasize that in, especially in the case of like parents and money, a lot of it has to do with class. Hmm. Um, I mean, people take in kind of a class belonging orientation to finances that they then either repeat or if they've moved, if they've shifted from one class to another, they will at some point struggle with those issues. Um, but how not to pass things on, how to break the cycle. I think one way to break the cycle in general, that's true for parenting in general, not just finances, is to be um, transparent with your kids about how you're thinking about these issues. So not only transparent about your relationship with money, but transparent about how you observe your own relationship to money, because each of us have parents too. And we have, we have interesting thoughts within us in terms of how we understand our relationship to money. And we can share those thoughts with our kids. We can teach them how to self-reflect about their relationship to money and then make choices with like armed with this third position, this perch of self-reflection. So when you're, when you're, let's say you're struggling between, let's say you come from a very impulsive background, like your, your, your parents were very impulsive and you saw them act impulsively with money you can think about it out loud and struggle with your impulse. I, I want to spend right now, I want to buy this thing and I don't care if it's going to cost me next month, I'm not going to be able to pay rent. Like think about it out loud, show your kid how you struggle with it. Not only what you end up doing, but, but your thought process. So I think that's the best gift. Um, someone is asking for tips on two people uh, together from wildly different class backgrounds. First of all, again, I'm an analyst, so I have most things that people ask me, I say, very interesting. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. Um, keep in mind that um, if you're coming from different class backgrounds, it's going to play out in all sorts of surprising arenas in your life. It's going to play out for sure around money. It's going to play out around um, what time to go to bed. It's going to play out in terms of how to raise your kids. It's going to play out in many different ways, um, whether something is rude or not rude. Um, and I, what I would advise people to do is to be really interested in how class 
intersects with whatever preferences they have and whatever conflicts they have and assume that you can't solve those things. Those are differences that are gonna be forever interrogated, uh, useful information about yourselves, about the couple, about society at large, really interesting questions, but you're not gonna just solve it. These are not questions that you can have like one conversation and solve the problem. These are differences that are deeply held, deeply emotional um, and require just ongoing curiosity and interrogation. And, and not try to impose your class thinking on another, but really try to make room for many. Hmm. Um, what are some common financial practices that you observe in healthy couples? Um, I would say transparency, like honesty, transparency, super important, and generosity. And by generosity, I don't just mean generosity in terms of like financial generosity, but generosity of spirit in terms of being able to understand that people operate from different sets of needs and wants and not imposing your own set of values, needs and wants on another, but being willing and wanting to understand your partner on their terms and kind of being creative in terms of finding solutions based on that kind of egalitarian democratic model. Hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, this is interesting. So we, um, one of the things that we hear a lot when we talk about therapy on the channel is how financially prohibitive it can be for a lot of people um, and how it's just not super accessible. Um, so this person is asking, and I think this sort of represents that a bit, how do you help clients um, or what do you recommend for people with financial anxiety when therapy can be one of their biggest expenses and therefore one of the biggest drivers of that anxiety? Um, I would recommend, um, first of all, engaging in therapy that, is, that fits your means. So don't overspend on therapy. Spend therapy based on what you can afford. And even though it's hard to find, there are therapies in, in for all levels of income. There are um, expensive therapists, there are middle of the road therapists, and there are all sorts of opportunities and options for people to spend quite little on therapy if that's what they have. There are training institutes where uh, less experienced clinicians get really great supervision and do fantastic work and sometimes because they're beginners they actually put their heart and soul into it so they can do better work sometimes than the more seasoned of us um there are community uh settings that offer treatment for less um able communities group therapy is sometimes a really powerful modality and is less expensive there are all sorts of ways to get therapy but but therapy should be should fit within your life. It shouldn't be some kind of added expense that doesn't make sense. It, it, it should be part of how you live. So obviously for most couple, not most, but for many couples, one of the biggest kind of life events choices um, that it can either bring out or aggravate financial um, differences is having children. Um, you know, we don't often talk, I think, about having children as uh, a financial decision, but for many people, it's the most consequential financial decision they'll ever make in their life. So I feel like we could address that a little bit more. Um, we have a lot of people asking questions around the topic of children. Um, one of them is asking, uh, what should I do if I very much want children, um, but my partner is not sure that they ever will. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I have certainly I've worked with many people who were struggling with that issue. Um, it's interesting, there's gonna be, uh, on, on the season that we're filming now, there's a couple that's working through that difference. Um, I, I would say the same thing that I say about any significant difference between two people in a relationship. Um, approach the issue, first of all, from a position of not imposing 
and not expecting to be imposed upon. So open up the discussion and it's never gonna be just one discussion on issues like that, but, but open up a process of first of all, trying to do your best to understand the other person and make sure they feel understood and then vice versa for you to be able to really articulate your own reasons and make sure your partner understands it. And then try to think of it from different perspectives, try to get creative, like beyond the, the one and the other. First of all, most of the time when people have like two, let's say polarized positions, usually the truth of the matter is that each one of them is to some degree ambivalent about the issue. Even the people that come in and say, I definitely don't want kids. There's a part of them that's wondering, am I missing out on something? Would I feel differently under different circumstances? I mean, often there's like some, some inner ambivalence or debate there and vice versa on the other side also, the people who say, I really, really want kids. In the back of their mind, they're also, they also might be thinking, oh my God, is my life gonna be over when I have kids? Will I be able to afford it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, people are ambivalent. They're not monolithic in terms of their opinions. And if you create a situation where it's not a, a win-lose and, and not a completely adversary uh, discussion or fight, but really putting everything on the table and trying to think through it, all sorts of new permutations arise and you might arrive at unexpected outcomes if you really open up the discussion and, and give it the time and give it the space it needs. But the moment you create a situation where one person tries to force or manipulate or threaten or withdraw, kind of put pressure, yeah, it, things immediately get polarized. That's not a good outcome. No. Um, also, I just feel like we shouldn't be in the business of trying to convince people uh, about something as consequential as whether or not to have a kid. You can maybe convince someone that you're better off taking the Amtrak to DC than driving, but I don't know that we need to um, bear down on each other about whether or not we need to bring a kid into the world. Um, a lot of people asking what you think about prenups. Very tricky. Um, what do I think about prenups? I think prenups um, are designed to um, solve certain kind of anxieties. It could be anxieties about abandonment. It can be anxieties about dependence. It can be paranoid anxieties about exploitation. There are all sorts of anxieties that fuel prenups and, and some of them even have to do with like loyalties, like who are you loyal to? Are you loyal to your family of origin or to your new partner? And there are all sorts of anxieties and issues that prenups try to solve. And sometimes they do manage to bind those anxieties and, and resolve certain tensions. However, prenups also um, have an effect forward. And not only an effect in terms of, oh my God, what happens if we split up? They, but they will also color how people experience their marriage. So if a prenup is motivated by, let's say a lot of paranoia, the marriage is gonna be fueled by that. It's gonna be colored by a paranoid prenup. If a prenup is um, designed with a spirit of great generosity and, and cr just really creating a lot of safety for everyone, then it will color the marriage that way. So a, a prenup doesn't only uh, color what will happen if we get divorced, it also colors the marriage. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Well, I, I do feel an eth a sort of ethical obligation from my own perspective to say that I do believe everyone should get a prenup, um, but not so much because I think uh, everyone is going to necessarily need one, but in part because of what you're saying in terms of the spirit in which a prenup is done, I think it, it, it would be much healthier if we all sort of normalized the process of planning for every possible outcome, including ones where we don't end up together. Um, or even, you know, your partner could be incapacitated. Something really dramatic could change. Um, suffice to say, I think, I agree with you that if, a prenup is done in the spirit of I'm trying to, I'm suspicious of this person and I want to inoculate myself against whatever I think they're going to do. I actually think 
are, are you sure you guys should be getting married would be my next question uh, if that's what you're thinking about. But I do think often people, because they're less common and I think they, they used to be much more heavily associated with people with really substantial assets, especially familial assets and things like that, people I think tend to frame them pr through a prism of you only need one if you think something bad is going to happen. And you mentioned you know, the possibility of doing a prenup in a spirit of generosity and a spirit of I love you and even if we don't end up together, I want to make sure that we're both treated fairly and so on. Um, and as a last note, and I have to credit this to our former season one guest, uh, divorce lawyer James Sexton, who reminded us all, everyone has a prenup. Uh, it's just, it might just be whatever the default laws of your state are um, if you haven't taken the time to do one. Um, but I definitely agree that a lot of them can be done in, in really kind of acrimonious and circumstances or bad faith. And that seems like not a good harbinger for the marriage. <laughs> A lot of people asking about essentially some variation of, I want to go to therapy, a couple's therapy. My partner doesn't. How do I get them to go? Um, you barter. You say, how about we give it a try? If you do, if you agree to do it this way, here's what I'll do for you. We do love a good negotiation here at the, at the financial diet. Bartering. I'm, I'm very pro bartering. How do you split slash should you split things equally even if one person makes more? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, and, and very much, again, depends on the kind of ideology people come into the relationship with. I mean, some people believe that how much you earn should not make any difference and we're equal citizens and... If one, if the couple is lucky that one person is earning more, both should be happy about it. And some people believe that if you earn more, you get more. If you're putting in more money, you get more rights. Um, again, I don't have my own opinion about it. I mean, I, I have how I like to live, but I don't, I don't, I don't think one size fits all. But I think being open about what your assumptions are in terms of what money allows you in a relationship is really important to do, to have those conversations. We, we had that, you know, um, I think it was in the first season, Sarah and Lauren uh, had that discussion between them, a very open discussion that was edited into the series um, where um, Lauren earned more and believed that she the her earning power gave her more rights in terms of for example not doing as much housework and her partner sarah thought what the hell that has nothing to do with housework both of us should be doing housework and nothing to do with earning what it's like and it was very interesting for them to negotiate and influence each other on this front and lauren eventually kind of gave up that position and thought you know what that's kind of a patriarchal position and i don't want to be affiliated with that position but that's what she came in with so they had to have lots of conversations about it to kind of uh, find their common ground. Yeah, that's really, really common, just sort of like the inherent undervaluing of domestic labor as, you know, labor that's being brought into, uh, or value rather, that's being brought into any kind of partnership. And But I would also say to people in this situation, because we hear about it all the time, ultimately, um, it is very, very easy for a substantial power dynamic in terms of earning to turn into control, coercion, uh, undue influence, even a financial abuse in some cases. Um, and I do think it's very incumbent on the person who is the higher earner in the relationship to make sure that they're finding ways to offset the power imbalance that that creates in their favor, because that can easily kind of spiral. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you again so much. Where can our audience go to find more of what you do? Well, I write. Awesome. <laughs> I have papers out there. <laughs> so, nice. um, and the series, of course. And there are lots of books on psychoanalysis, couples, and all of that, not written by me, that are interesting for people to read. Um, and Chelsea, thank you. These were like really, really interesting questions. I'm, I'm uh, kind of the depth of your questions and your audience was really wonderful for me to engage with. Well, thank you. Our audience uh, is, in my opinion, one of the best on the internet. So uh, they sent in great questions as always. Uh, and thank you guys as always for tuning in and we will see you next Monday on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Goodbye. <laughs>